quick okay all right um so unfortunately i forgot to turn on the recording so i'm going to record this part now muscle tissue and nervous tissue and i'm going to have another session for another class later to this tonight and i'll record for them and then i'll post everybody the first part okay all right so this is what we're going to do we're going to go over muscle tissue and when it comes to muscle tissue we do the same thing first we go over the general characteristics so general characteristic is that the tissue is made of cells just like epithelial tissue this is a cellular tissue so we're going to have cells on top of cells below cells etc the tricky thing about muscle tissue is the names of the cells the names of the cells is fibers so we call them muscle fibers, which is incredibly confusing because these are not fibers, these are cells. But historically speaking, when they were looked at under microscopes, they looked like fibers. And scientists didn't know they were cells, they thought they were protein fibers. So they call them fibers, but they're not, they're cells. The name is stuck, and to this day we call them muscle fibers. So every time you hear the term muscle fibers, your mind should think muscle cell. So don't let the name fool you. We're trying to change it, but it's very, very hard. The new name is myocytes. MY means muscle, cyto means cell. So that would be the perfect name. So maybe someday we'll all call them myocytes. For now, for the most part, you're going to hear them called muscle fibers. So again, muscle fiber is the muscle cell. Um, the function is easy because they all do the same thing. Contract. Uh, so shortened, um, so it's a very specified function. They're there for contraction. And so as far as what they do, well, the contraction is going to move uh, bones, move the skin, move substances inside organs, etc. There are three types of muscle tissue, the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and a smooth muscle. Okay, so what I like to do with these is, um, we classify the tissue into a skeletal, a smooth, or cardiac based on what the tissue looks like. And then we're gonna go into where it's found. Remember the function is the same for all muscle tissue. The function is contraction. In the case of a skeletal muscle, when we think of muscle, typically this is the muscle we're thinking about. This is the muscle found attached to bones, uh, which moves bones. Some of it is attached to skin, so it will move skin, so it allows us to smile, for example. Uh, this is a very unique type of tissue in that it's very specialized. The cells are humongous, huge cells, long, long cylindrical cells. They're so big that you don't see the beginning at the end of the cell. In pretty much all of these the, uh, micro, micrograph pictures of the cell, you only see part of the cell. That's how big they are. Uh, they are rod shaped, the cell is rod shaped, and uh, because they're, they're so big, because they're made of many of these cells that came together during development, and they made this humongous cell. So because they're made from more than one cell, they're going to have more than one nucleus. So it's multinucleated. You can see these many, many nuclei within the cell. Uh, the cell is filled with a contractile protein, which creates these pattern of striations that you see here. And there are so many of these contractile proteins that there is no room for the organelles. So the organelles have to be pushed to the very surface of the cell. So you can see the little nuclei lined up on the surface because the entire cell is filled with contractile proteins whose arrangement makes this pattern of striations. So this is a striated, multinucleated, cells. Um, functioned voluntary movement of muscles and skin. And this is another function, heat generation. This is one of the tissues, one of the organs that is involved in creating heat when we are under hypothermia. Uh, so shivering, attached to bones and skin. Okay. Next one is cardiac muscle. Uh, in this case, the cells are going to have also going to be elongated, but they're going to have a different shape. They're going to be branched. So they are described as branched. You can see here how they are branched. So they are uh, typically draw them this way. So they have these branches. They are they have one nuclear, they're uninucleated, and then the branches um, connect with the next 
next cell. So here comes the next cell, which is also branched. And here's another cell, which is also branched. So again, a single cell, single nucleus, sorry. Uh, they are striated. You can see the pattern of, uh, of striation right there. So they're striated cells. Okay. Look for the uh, striations. The minute you see striations, then you have two choices. You either have uh, uh, skeletal muscle cells or you have cardiac muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells are going to have many nuclei and they're going to be elongated. Cardiac muscle are going to have one nuclei and they are going to be branched. You can see the branches there. Okay. All right. The other characteristic are these little areas right here that connect cells. So you can see it here, you can see it here, you can see it here. These, these structures are unique cardiac muscle cells. They're called intercalated discs. When something is unique to a cell, that means that structure is critical in the function of the cell. So these intercalated discs, we're going to see these next semester, but okay, these intercalated discs are critical in the function of cardiac muscle cells. Next and unique. Um, so cardiac muscle is uh, branch cells, is striated, one nuclei, occasionally multinucleated, but okay, most of the time just one nuclei. We definitely see intercalated discs. Um, the location is the walls of the heart. Okay, this brings me to another point. Every time you see the word walls, so tissue in the walls of an organ, that's going to be muscle tissue. So muscle tissue is described as being in the walls of an organ, not a skeletal muscle because that is by itself. That is of cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. It will always be described as being in the walls of the organ. Uh, function, okay, uh, move substances inside. Oh, in the case of, uh, of cardiac tissue, muscle is propulsion of blood. Okay. All right. Uh, next uh, muscle tissue is smooth muscle. It's called is smooth because it has no striations. And you can see here that in the picture how there are no lines going up around. Uh, the cells are very small. They are spindle shaped. They have one nuclei. And this is probably the hardest tissue to identify. So I'll um, show you more pictures of it and, and uh, con contrast it with other tissues that look similar. Uh, in the next session. But for now, you can see how these are just little cells, one after the other, no striation, single cells. The um, location is propulsion of the substances, liquids or solids inside the organ. Uh, the function, the location is, says, walls, again, there's that word walls, of hollow organs, viscera. Okay, hollow organs, for example, would be the um, stomach, stomach, intestines, uh, uterus, blood vessels, so the walls of blood vessels. What else am I leaving out? Um, gosh, I can't think of any other one off the top of my head, but I'm, oh yeah, uh, urinary bladder. There's another one. Okay, so pretty much any hollow organ is going to have a muscle wall. Okay. And the wall and the muscle will be a smooth muscle. Okay. So now we can jump to nervous tissue. And you know what? Before we jump to nervous tissue, let me do something really, really quick right here. Muscle tissue. I typically like to make a little chart of the muscle tissue. So this is a skeletal muscle tissue, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. And then we can summarize its characteristics uh, by location. So this will be uh, attached to bones and skin. Okay, I know this is a little hard to read. Cardia will be the heart. It's smooth, and actually you will even say walls of heart. That will be even better. So walls of heart, and then a smooth walls of hollow organs. I'm going to put this right. Okay, so that's one characteristic. The other one will be a striations. Okay, 
This one, yes. This one, yes. This one, no. Oops. Okay. Uh, intercalated disks, I'm going to put ID or intercalated disk. This one, no. This one, yes. This one, no. Then I'm going to put nuclei. This one, many. This one, one. This one, one. Uh, last, let's see if I can have room here. Um, uh, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. So this one is voluntary and the other two are involuntary. What this means is whether we can move the muscle at will. All the skeletal muscle can be moved at will. We, we move it if we want to. Um, cardiac muscle, even if we try to, we couldn't control the, the beating of the heart voluntarily. It is an involuntary function. Same thing with the smooth muscle. As hard as we try, we cannot control the contraction of the muscles of the stomach. That's involuntary. Now, one little point here. The fact that a skeletal muscle could be controlled voluntarily doesn't mean we always do that. Think about these. All of the respiratory muscles are voluntary. Uh, we can move them at will if we wanted to. We can increase our respiratory rate by moving them faster. We can slow it down by moving them slower. So they're all voluntary muscles. They're all the skeletal muscles, the diaphragm, uh, the intercostal muscles. These are all respiratory muscles, and they're voluntary. They're skeletal muscles. However, most of the time, we're not voluntarily moving them. We let the brain take over, and it is an automatic movement that takes place. We don't think about breathing. We just do it. So we relinquish the function, uh, the control of the function, to the brain, and it becomes an uh, automatic contraction. Okay, that doesn't mean it's involuntary. It could be voluntary. We just choose not to make it voluntary. Okay, so uh, these um, many of these skeletal muscles uh, muscles are are voluntary, but some but some of them we could be moved uh, by automatic uh, functions. Okay, so I just want to make a point of that. Okay, so that's a good summary of the characteristics of muscles. And by the way, muscles will come back. So we're going to see muscles again later in the chapter when we go over the, in, later in the semester when we go over the chapter on muscles. All right, last thing would be the nervous tissue, which is actually easy. Nervous tissue is again cellular, made of cells, uh, but the cells are very, very special, very different. Uh, there's two types of cells in nervous tissue, neurons and glial cells. Neurons are the main cells of nervous tissue, Glial cells are the helper cells. Um, the function of the tissue is to create electrical signals and transmit electrical signals. Glial cells are just the helpers they support, um, meaning they give uh, nutrients and oxygen and remove waste from the neurons, which are busy creating electrical signals. Location, brain, spinal cord, nerves. I can even add receptors to that list too, because receptors are neurons. Um, what they look like, let's look at the picture, which is, uh, is that the only picture I have? Uh, it's not a great picture. Uh, these big cells right here, neurons are humongous cells. That would be a neuron, another little neuron. Uh, the little dots there are the uh, glial cells. So glial cells are tiny little cells. Again, this is a huge, neurons are humongous cells. Take a look at the magnification, 350. Uh, look at other magnifications, they're going to be a lot higher than these. Uh, so we can look at these cells and the low magnification. Uh, the cells typically have a long appendage. We don't need to know the names of the appendages. We'll have a whole chapter to worry about the neurons, okay? So these are the neurons and the little dots that you see here and there will be the glial cells. So when it comes to nervous tissue, know the, know the names of the cells, know the location. Uh, the chapter now turns to membranes. And let me quickly go over membranes of the body. We have already seen one category of membranes, which are the serous membranes. Another type of membrane would be the skin, the cutaneous membrane, which is made of uh, epithelial tissue. And we know that now. Uh, mucous membranes are membranes that line body cavities. So there you go, the word line, which means that these membranes will also be made of epithelial tissue. They're called mucus because they're going to secrete 
mucus, like a fluid. So that tells you the, the uh, respiratory tract, the digestive tract, which have goblet cells, are going to be mucous membranes. <clears throat> so they show you here the respiratory tract made of a uh, uh, lined with sort of stratified columnar epithelium, the GI tract lined with simple columnar epithelial. Uh, these are all create these mucous membranes. The next serous membrane is the, are the serosa, which we already saw in chapter one. And the serosa are going to line uh, closed off cavities of the body. So I'm not going to go over these. We did that last uh, chapter. And the tissue close, I mean the tissue, the chapter closes with looking at inflammation. Uh, you do need to know the, uh, what is inflammation? Inflammation is a definition of inflammation, is the response to tissue damage. And you should also know the signs and symptoms of inflammation, redness, heat, swelling, pain, sometimes loss of function. So definitely that. So the purpose of inflammation is to reverse the damage, heal the tissue. Uh, typically, that you know, always I should say, not typically, inflammation comes with redness and heat, because blood vessels in the area where inflammation is taking place are going to dilate, and the increase in circulation will cause the redness and the heat. Uh, blood vessels are also going to become porous, permeable. They're going to lose fluid, and the fluid that escapes swells the tissue presses on pain uh, receptors and causes pain. So you should definitely know the signs and symptoms of inflammation and what is causing these signs and symptoms. Um, and then just quickly go over what happens when tissue is being repaired. Uh, if the tissue has broken blood vessels, then there will be a clot formed. Um, there will be uh, tissue being made to bring the, the uh, I'm sorry, collagen fibers being made to bring the parts that have been broken off together. And then a lot of little cells are going to come along to repair the tissue. Uh, this creates a granulation tissue. All these cells come into the area. Under the microscope looks like little granules coming in there. All these cells that are coming in is what we call um, granulation tissue. A lot of the cells are going to be fibroblasts, which are connective tissue cells that are going to make collagen fibers to bridge the areas that had been broken off. Um, the uh, collagen fibers come together, repair the tissue, and uh, create the sometimes, oftentimes, create excess collagen in the area which will be uh, seen later on as a scar tissue. So the scar tissue is this excess collagen that pushes the tissue up a little scar. All right, so that should be the end of uh, this chapter. Um, because we didn't cover connective tissue, I'll make another um, session for tomorrow where we're gonna go ahead and cover connective tissue. Should not take more than an hour to cover that. So. Um, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And uh, I will send you guys the uh, time when we're going to meet again for the connective tissue session. Okay. Uh, have a good evening, afternoon. And I'm going to go ahead and sign off now.